humans were at least occasionally used in execration rituals in Egypt. So. Thank you. If you'll remember, we also mentioned that these, these triumph processions uh, were part of these execration rites. There's another form of celebrating triumph that most Egyptologists have, have assumed was only iconographic, and if it ever happened to a real person, that was very, very early uh, in Egyptian history. But recently, we've called that into question, and, and uh, the work that uh, we've done on that has met a large degree of, of uh, acceptance, and that has to do with the smiting scene. This is a scene that you'll find on the bracelet, is this one, or uh, it's prevalent on temple walls and various other places where the pharaoh is holding the, uh, the head of an enemy or sometimes many, many, many enemies, and he has either, a, earlier it's always a mace and eventually it will sometimes be a sword, axe, or something along those, those lines, uh, and he's going to kill these prisoners. Now, often these were only iconographic, but there has been a lot of evidence that indicates that sometimes they really did use humans. Some of that evidence takes the form of uh, textual evidence, such as saying that they were struck down before something else happened to them. Uh, we even have a text from Ramses III, who, when, uh, who had taken a prince uh, prisoner, and when his father came to plead for his life, Ramses became enraged, uh, and it says he came down on their heads like granite, and they died. Uh, that sounds a lot like a, a mace or something like that coming on their head. It sounds to me like a description of a smiting scene, but perhaps the most uh, convincing evidence comes from a collection of stelae compiled by Shulman. Uh, you can see the stele here, it's hard to make it out, uh, so we'll, we'll put the line drawing up instead, that's a little bit easier to see. What you can see here, this is a commemorative stele, commemorating one of the, the most important events in the person's life. This is the owner of the stele. This is a depiction of the temple, and you see within the temple, the pharaoh, he's holding this, the hair of the prisoner, a typical smiting scene, before a statue of the god of Toth. And apparently, the, what this seems to be indicating is that this person, this owner, was allowed, for whatever reason, as a reward or some other reason, was allowed to be present to witch, witness a ritual smiting in the temple. And this was such an impressive event for him that he commemorated it uh, for eternity. Uh, but it gives us the idea that there were times when the pharaoh really would come to the statue of a goddess. What we see in the text and on, on the walls all the time, but people have assumed they didn't really do that. I'm not sure how we come to that. Well, th there are some problems. It's, it's sure that sometimes these fighting scenes weren't representing a real event. Uh, but it seems that sometimes they really were. Uh, this is one of those. He collected a number of stelae. Let me just show you one other, where again you see a person showing this reverence to the pharaoh, and the pharaoh has uh, someone here, and this is again a stella that, that commemorates this in the person's life. And so it seems fairly sure that many of the, not all, but many of the smiting scenes represented a real event where they really did kill a person in the temple in some kind of ritual. Uh, again, it's not as important for us to be able to distinguish which ones were real and which ones were only iconographic, as it is to understand that some were real, that these violent rituals could be taken out on humans. Also, astral rituals, which we've mentioned before. Uh, you see here the famous zodiac in the, the ceiling of the Dendera temple, which commemorates how uh, important astral events were to them. And also from Dendera, you see the pharaoh with, uh, followed in a bark by a cow who is representing the star Sophus. That one is particularly important for us because we're going to talk about a text from Prince Osirkan. Uh, Osir Khan was a prince who had been set to take uh, care of, he was the general of the armies and was also asked to be in control over southern Egypt, including and most especially Thebes. The Thebans, because he and his father were Libyan, the Egyptian Thebans were not so excited about this and decided they would not accept his rule. They rebelled against him. Thus, Osir Khan uh, engaged in a long drawn out war with them and in the end he was able to to defeat them, and the leaders of the rebellion were corralled in the temple in Karnak. And he was able to actually get them, they all fled to a particular building, we think we know which building, because he mentions burning the building down, and we found a building that was burned down during that time period uh, in the temple of Karnak. In any case, he gets them all in this particular building, he's not very happy with them, and so this is what he says. They were brought to him immediately like a bunch of pinioned ones, and we've already heard that reference, this is a phrase that that has to do with sacrifice. Then he struck them down for him, 
causing them to be carried like goats on the night of the feast of the evening sacrifice. So this is a daily sacrifice, an evening sacrifice. And in this case, the rebels became the, the typically we think of the animals being substitutes for humans. In this case, the humans became substitutes for the animals, which were substitutes for humans. So it's an interesting circle. But in any case, uh, we have them being part of the daily sacrifice. And then he says, uh, like braziers at the going forth of Sophus. This is uh, a burnt offering that was done uh, as Sophus rises again. And so they were also, these humans were also used in that ritual. It seems fairly clear that that's what he's saying. It's hard to argue against that. Every man was burned with fire at the place of his crime. So there they seem to have been burned as part of these sacrifices. Interestingly, we also have this phrase, then he struck them down for him. Uh, and it has the knife determinative, which you can see here, meaning some kind of a blade was used in striking them down. I would argue that that's also evidence for smiting. Most likely, they weren't thrown on the braziers to be burned alive, uh, or at least not fully well and alive, or they would try to get off. Uh, instead, they seem to have been struck, I would guess, in a ritual smiting, and then sacrificed on the braziers, like an animal would be in the evening sacrifice, or at the going forth of Sophus. So we have some fairly strong evidence here that humans were used in all of these kinds of uh, occasions. Let's also look at festivals. Uh, I mean, the going forth of Sophus was probably a festival, festival, and there, by the end of Egyptian history, they had so many festivals that somewhere in Egypt, if we look at all the festivals we know of, probably about every other day, somewhere in Egypt, there was a serious religious festival going on, which is nice to be a festive people. Uh, one festival in particular we'll look at is the Koyak Festival. This was a festival that celebrated uh, the, the resurrection of Osiris, really. After he had been killed by his brother, his sisters uh, are able to bring him back to life. And this celebrates fertility of all kinds. And so usually they would water, they would plant seeds and water them, hoping that the grain would grow. And it would be a, a wonderful festival. Uh, thanks to uh, my colleague here, John E., he has noticed that the Koyak Festival, in, in, on a certain day, in our, the text that we have about the Koyak Festival from uh, Karnak, it says that the great rite of execration was to be performed, which is very interesting. If we, if we couple that, the other place that we learn a tremendous amount about the Koyak Festival is from some scenes in the Dendera chapel, uh, which interestingly parallel uh, facsimile one in the Book of Abraham. Those scenes are about the Koyak Festival, and yet the texts of those scenes often talk about, especially on the, on the same day, the same day of the Koyak Festival, which was, a, if I remember correctly, a 21-day festival, uh, the day when you wrapped the, the, the corn mummy of Osiris was the same day, according to the, the, the Dendera text, was the same day that in the Abydos text was the execration rite was performed. And if we look at the scenes in the Dendera chapel when they wrapped the, the mummy of Osiris, there are a number of texts that say that enemies will be slaughtered, that they will be burned, carried to the slaughterhouse. Anyone who comes to endanger uh, Osiris will be hacked up. Uh, and there's even a god Sheshmu present who's a god of human sacrifice. And so it seems fairly clear that there were times that uh, the execration rite was part of the Koyak festival and that there were times that this could have been humans. Uh, Dr. D has been doing some work on that recently. A very similar rite was the festival of kites. This is a festival of kites. Kites are two birds that uh, the legend has it that uh, when Osiris was killed, his two sisters turned into these two birds, the kites. And in the festival of kites, they, it's a festival done to bring Osiris back to life and to uh, have regeneration in that way. And, and uh, Isis is supposed to be impregnated by him there and give birth to horse and so on. In the middle of this ritual, we have the text that describes the ritual. In the middle, it just stops. It's describing all sorts of, it's got dialogue between Isis, Nephthys, and Osiris. And then it just stops and has one line. The great rite of protection to be performed in silence. And I would assume that rite of protection is a kind of execration rite to thwart off all evil forces. And so I, I think we have, again, this connection uh, between recreation and uh, ritual violence against humans. We also have festivals for deity. Uh, most of those, we, we don't know of anything going on with uh, humans. But again, from the tomb of Antifi, you can see his tomb here. And he talks about the festival for Heman uh, in this tomb. And then he says, if anyone damages my tomb, instead of sacrificing the bull or the gazelle, sacrifice the person who 
desecrated my tomb. There was some argument that when this was